uh, implements the FAT file system on the SD card. And so by creating uh, a directory path which matched the MAC address of any uh, access point as I accessed it, uh, I could then just check to see if that file existed and hey, you've got a simple on-disk database of, of all the access points. And so uh, then that uh, records it to a, a file uh, and then carries on. And then uh, potentially uh, this could also serve up the data. Um, but in, uh, as, as far as I've modified it so far, uh, basically it records the SD card and then you can pull it off onto your own machine. Are we in luck? Yep. Yeah. Plus, they were a bit harder to fit in your backpack. Yeah. But yeah, I mean that, that that's totally um, that it's kind of going back to to yeah, like the seventies and eighties where you could actually achieve a lot without a um, you know with without a whole lot of support in terms of RAM and and so forth. Oh, cool. Okay, so um, uh, so this is uh, basically the result of of opening up uh, uh, the uh, the logged file uh, and uh, using a, a pro another project called Open Layers, which does uh, mapping and provides a JavaScript interface and uh, uses OpenStreetMap for the the mapping data. And so basically it's uh, recorded uh, whether or not it's an open network, a WPA uh, network or a, or a wet network uh, with different colored stars to make it look pretty. Uh, and yeah, so that's all produced uh, automatically from, from the log file once you've uh, got it. Now the interesting thing is that in theory that, that particular page is being served off a server, but in theory uh, aside from the actual map data, the, da the whole page itself could be served off the module as well, which then gives you the ability to uh, access it uh, remotely uh, or potentially to have the unit upload the data uh, autonomously so it can just uh, sit in your backpack or, or sit uh, at a, in a target area. And this was in case the uh, demo didn't work, but of course it did. So when it finds it again. Linux is totally uh, AV, desktop. anybody? <laughs> It's finding it. So uh, the the next topic, when we get up to it, uh, is uh, software USB. So uh, there's been a few talks already uh, this week, both at. Uh, at B-Sides, uh, and I think there's some more coming up today, uh, about software or, or about USB fuzzing uh, and fun stuff that you can do uh, if you can create your own custom USB device. So a lot of those solutions use a, a hardware USB implementation. Uh, there was a guy in Austria that wrote uh, a software USB implementation called VUSB, which was previously known as uh, AVR USB. And uh, basically this guy, apparently in one of Austria's long winter nights, uh, sat down and decided that he'd work out how to implement low speed USB in software. So basically that was assembly uh, level hacking, uh, you know, working out individual clock cycles and managed to get this chip, uh, which uh, only runs at 16 megahertz, to, to actually support low speed USB. So you can uh, 
implement low-speed USB devices. So that's things like keyboards, uh, mice, and uh, those sorts of things. Uh, then uh, I came along and thought that was pretty cool, and a few people had kind of used it around things, but there wasn't a lot documented, uh, and there wasn't an easy way to access it from the Arduino environment. So I created a, a Arduino library uh, that wrapped uh, vUSB. So some of the projects that have done keyboard emulation in the past are things like Caps Locker from a couple of years ago when you plugged a USB device in uh, and it would toggle the Caps Lock key on your victim's computer at random so they think that their keyboard is broken. Um, I implemented an example of that called the, uh, uh, that, that, that performed the same technique. Um, slightly more useful is there's a, a project called YubiKey which actually does authentication and it will send in uh, an authentication key uh, when you press a button or something like that, which means you don't have to type in something from a, a two-factor authentic authentication device. So uh, as an example of how you can uh, use uh, the USB side of things, uh, this is a uh, two parts. The first part is a, a piece of Python code. Uh, and it creates, uses libUSB in the background to create what's essentially a serial connection to, to a device. And then uh, the USB code on the Arduino is this section and basically it reads whatever's being sent over it. Now uh, I can give you a demo of something here. So so basically this here has uh, a uh, Atmel chip in it which is running uh, in the same way as, as an Arduino. Uh, it's got a switch on the back and a pretty light on the front which isn't uh, uh, doing anything at the moment. Uh, when you press the button down it changes into a uh, green light mode, uh, which means that when you press the, uh, the button again, it'll type out my domain name, which is really impressive when you have a decent internet connection and that actually goes there. Uh, but basically the idea is that you can uh, send any keystrokes that you like. So that includes things like on, uh, on a Mac, you can do things like make uh, expose or dashboard appear and disappear. Uh, some of the other projects uh, that, that have been mentioned and, and I think are coming up again uh, later today uh, do things like they'll actually send the content of an exploit or something like that. Um, one advantage with this approach is that basically you need the chip and about four passive components and the actual connector yourself um, and so it's really cheap uh, and really easy to get started with as well. Um, there are downsides to it, they don't, it doesn't work in every device, um, in fact I've got one laptop where it'll work if you plug it into one USB port on one side but it won't work if you plug it in on the other side. Uh, but it's still fun to be actually be able to create a USB device and, uh, and do stuff with it. Uh, one of the other projects is uh, software protection dongles. Um, I uh, won't demonstrate it now, but basically you can uh, have a chunk of Python uh, which is encrypted in some way, uh, send it out to the device which will then decrypt it and then send it back. Um, which is really just an example of how you can have uh, an external device perform some function uh, that won't work if it's, uh, if it's not connected. And of course we know how well software protection dongles work in practice. So uh, one of the other aspects is uh, USB fuzzing. Uh, so this is the idea of finding faults in uh, drivers uh, and uh, hopefully uh, exploiting them. Uh, for those who don't know how USB works, essentially uh, when you plug in a USB device, the host says, hi, who are you? And the device says, oh, hey, I'm this device here and gives a vendor ID and a product ID. And uh, how fu uh, fuzzing works, and so normally the, the host would, would add a, uh, load the correct driver and things would carry on happening. Uh, so what you do with USB fuzzing, or at least the, the first stage of it, is you say, oh hi, I'm this device. Oh hi, I'm this device. Oh hi, I'm this device. And then eventually, uh, if you're lucky, your operating system will go, oh hey, I've got a driver for that, here, let's load it. Uh, and then uh, because you're not actually that device, if the driver is making some assumption about the way that you work, uh, it'll uh, dislike it. So the question is, does it actually work? Um, well, the answer is yes. 
Uh, so this is uh, a log taken from, uh, I think it was a Ubuntu 904 or something like that machine. And basically by uh, plugging in the device and pretending to be uh, a particular IPAC device, the IPAC driver would load and then uh, I think it was a null pointer D reference that it encountered. Now the interesting thing about this was that uh, when the crash happened, basically no more USB devices were recognised uh, and you had to reboot the machine to actually get USB back. And the funny thing was that it, it could actually still do this even if you were just sitting on the login screen, which means there's a whole lot of stuff about, well, why are you making every single USB driver active at the login screen because, you know, you're not going to use half of them there. Um, but it also means that, that it creates a greater uh, attack surface because it means that you don't actually have to only have a, a device that might handle some sort of input. It can be any device because the drivers are potentially going to be loaded already. So um, there's uh, other people have, have done some work on, on that as well. Um, the, the, this is the really sophisticated program that uh, will cause the crash. Uh, it sets the vendor ID and the product ID and then it sits there and waits for you to yeah, plug it in. So uh, Lee is going to talk a little bit more about uh, the USB fuzzing side of things and what other people have done. So just from, from this slide here, you got that IPAC crash from running through the entire Linux USB device ID database. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so basically there's a, there's a list of known USB devices and so I, um, the, the, code that, that the code that didn't just exploit it but actually uh, searched for it went through the whole list and, and tried it out. Um, there's potentially other devices that aren't supported in, uh, on other uh, operating systems so you could actually just go through the complete uh, key space on, on that. Sorry about all the AV fail, folks. All right, so a few other ideas, inspiration um, about potential ways that this kind of hardware attacks can be used. Um, how about a pocket uh, RFID data collector in the same way as we implemented um, why, uh, war driving here, potentially you could walk around collecting RFID identification tokens or something like that. Much smaller self-contained rig possible than um, sort of hooking it up to a laptop. laptop. Um, similarly with Bluetooth, with the Bluesmith module, um, follower already mentioned the uh, the pin f pin catcher that was in it, what was that was built. Um, there's a wide variety of other applications for Bluetooth sniffing possible. Um, appliance control. Did you want to go back to talking yeah. about that? Yeah. So uh, one of the other approaches. Uh, that you can do is you might go, hey, um, can I control uh, some sort of mains-powered uh, device? And uh, 
the concept is really appealing, but unfortunately, um, it can also be lethal.